and situating ourselves in that presence of the Lord, all together we say the introductory prayer which will be displayed. God our Father, we come before you with sincere hearts, seeking and searching, asking for your guiding light. Speak to us, Lord, through the passion and death of your beloved Son, Jesus, so that we may grow in compassion and love and experience your peace. Give us an attentive mind, a listening ear and loving heart, so that we may hear and understand, love and imitate Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, and who we have decided to follow. Grant that we may learn the full meaning of love, and more importantly, that we may live love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that we will be renewed through the life, the suffering, and death of Jesus. May your love for us, seen through our Lord Jesus, inspire us to live by the courage of our conviction. May your kingdom come and be established on this earth, and may each of us have life and have it to the fullest. Help us always to realize that without pain there is no gain, Without the cross, there is no glory, and without suffering, no joy. Help us understand your great love as we reflect and meditate on the last seven words of Jesus. Fill us with your love so as to help us to learn the language of Jesus, the language of love. Amen. We take the first hymn, Father, forgive me. We take the first hymn. on a hill far away.
the first verse, Father, forgive them, for they do, they do not know what they are doing. The scene of mocking and shaming. His clothes were divided. Whatever kind of abuse we name it, it was given to Jesus at that point of time. The most vulnerable moments of his life. Some say it is a time to check how a human being is really made of. How that person will behave at the most vulnerable moments. This is the same Jesus. During his earthly life, he said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And the same line in the Gospel of Luke says, be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. So the perfection which Jesus spoke about is a perfection of mercy. It's a perfection of forgiveness. It's a perfection of love. Pope Francis repeatedly says, we can judge others. We do judge. But our judgments are most often unlike the judgment of God. Because, not only because we are not omnipotent, we can see everything just as God sees everything, but more because God's judgment always contains mercy. And many a times our judgment does not contain. So this was a teaching of Jesus. In the Beatitudes, same Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. And when Peter came to Jesus and said, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus says, 70 times seven. Or whatever it is, it's not about the number, it's about an unconditional, unlimited forgiveness. Now, he has said so much about forgiveness. He had made a big deal about forgiveness in his earthly life. Now, we can see at the cross probably, yes, now it is a time, Jesus, now you have to show what you have said. And that is the most vulnerable moment of his life, the moment for him to show what he has said. It's good to ask ourselves, what is the use of forgiveness? What is the use of mercy? Whether it does some good. One image that always captures me in the scene of the passion is that centurion, a man who has not seen, we don't know really, but I believe at least he has not heard much about the miracles and other things which Jesus has done. But he has seen this journey of Jesus, at least to some extent he has seen the passion journey. He was there at the foot of the cross, he saw this fellow Jesus dying on the cross. And we don't know why, what, what made him to say at that moment that this was the son of God. It is difficult to give an answer, but probably I believe it is an experience deep down of God's mercy and love for this person. Take the example of Stephen, the first deacon of the church, first martyr of the church. When he was martyred, probably one of the last words which he said was, they do not know what they are doing. Almost the same verse which Jesus uttered. And we know that this verse which he uttered, that mercy which was offered by Jesus through Stephen to Paul, made Saul became Paul. We take the example of Rani Maria, probably a very clo a saint closer to our place, who was killed, whose prisoner was in the jail for so many years, and finally, because of a priest who was ministering there, he had talked to this particular person. He has also talked to his sister, her sister, sorry, the sister of this particular sister, Rani Maria, and also to the family. And finally, the family, especially the mother and her sister, and definitely also the other members, they forgive this person. And that brought a radical change in him. They accepted the family of Sister Rani Maria, or Blessed Rani Maria, have accepted this particular person as one of their son or brother. A forgiveness to the perfection, and that brought a radical change in the life. If you have heard about 
Saint Maria Goretti, it's almost the same story. Before her death, she forgave. And that forgiveness brought a radical change in the life of the fellow who killed her. And recently I was just reading about an article that came in a magazine where a story is mentioned about a lady named Jan, an attorney in US, attorney means a lawyer. She forgave the person who killed her sister, her sister's husband and their unborn child. Now, but the interesting aspect was, or the terrifying aspect was, the killer was remorseless, has never admitted of any guilt. Now, this is not a story of accidental death. It's a story of intentional murder. But this particular lady, Jan, decided to forgive. And people asked why, and she said this. During the mass, I hear often this phrase, you take away the sins of the world. Jan said she wasn't sure if she ever fully understand this statement. But she was sure that we should not take the person as a sin or we should not take the person for the sin which he or she has committed and freezed on it. No matter whatever that person has done, even if he or she repented, we should punish or we should never punish the person forever for that sin. And that's why she said, I decided to forgive. Now probably there is no rational answer for this. But somewhere deep down she experienced the mercy and in that strongest form of mercy she decided to forgive. And after that, somebody asked him, have you ever told this particular guy that I have forgiven? And she said, no. Then she immediately wrote a letter to him that I have forgiven. I have forgiven you. And after that, she got a letter back which said, you are right. I'm guilty of killing your sister and her husband. I also want to take this opportunity to express my deepest condolences and apologize to you. Maybe we might think that that condolences doesn't make any sense at all. But still, mercy has moved things. Maybe one last example I want to just bring from the gospel. In the gospel of Matthew where there are two incidences. One after the other. The first incidence is the woman. This was a reading a few days ago. The woman who washed the feet of Jesus. Not a disciple. A ordinary woman at the house of Simon the leper who washed the feet of Jesus and next scene immediately after that is a scene where Judas planning to betray Jesus he goes for the 30 silver coins what is the difference between two people one who was not even a disciple but acted much more like a disciple one who was a disciple who did not act like a disciple probably Okay, the Bible does not see the exact reason. I would say it is probably that that lady has experienced the mercy of God. Judas has not. We can be wonderful Christians, but we may or may not have experienced the mercy of God. And probably that can be the greatest tragedy too. God offers the mercy unconditionally to each one of us, just like he offered to that man. Now I want to just reflect on one more word that is coming in that phrase. For they do not know what they are doing. What does that mean? There is a very, very famous philosopher called Hannah Arendt who has spoken much about the evil, especially during the World War II. And she was attending a trial of the one senior official of the Nazi regime who was caught in the act of killing so many people in the concentration camp. And at the end of the trial, she finds this person to be an extremely ordinary person. He does not have any remorse. He does not think that he has done something terribly wrong. A person who has killed so many people in the Nazi regime 
but he doesn't think so. He has not done something wrong. He, has, he was saying, I was just following the orders. And she writes about this and says, many a times we become thoughtless people. The banality of evil. That means evil becomes, I'm not saying that evil is not right. For that person, it becomes a very, very ordinary act because he or she is not thinking. The same could be expressed even at the foot of the cross. So many people were there. There was a big crowd who sang Hosanna few days ago and who sang crucify him. Why? Probably because they never thought about it. A good question to ask ourselves. Are we people in community or in crowd? Are we people in community or in crowd? Crowd, you forget your own individuality. I forget the love of neighbor. I forget everything. I just follow something. Maybe it's an ideology, maybe a dictator or whatever it is. And sometimes leaders, dictators like crowd. Because if you want them to laugh, they will laugh. If you want them to cry, they will cry. It's good to ask ourselves, when I follow Jesus, am I in community or in crowd? Jesus always gives us the freedom. Community, there is freedom. In the crowd, there is no freedom. I make choices in the community. I decide to follow. Maybe that is my, two of my reflections for this. Maybe just one last point about this community and crowd. Pope Francis repeatedly says this. Dear parents, you are invited to form the conscience of people, of your children, and not to replace them with your conscience. When they are very small, you will tell them what is right and what is wrong. But when they are growing, you have to teach them how to say what is right and wrong. No, no, no. I will tell them always what is right and what is wrong. I think then you are allowing them to become part of a crowd. No. I think that is not the invitation for us. Each one of us receiving the mercy of God are also invited to be part of the Christian community. I'm sure that probably at the foot of the cross, uh, at the cross when Jesus told them, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. There was also an invitation for those people who are there to move from the crowd to become part of the community. And I'm sure after the resurrection, at least some of them have made that choice to become part of the community. I'm not saying none of you, none of us may be fully in the crowd, none of us may be fully in the community too. Maybe those areas in our life where we are in crowd, can we move away from that and move to community? Maybe I request each one of you to close your eyes for a few moments. We are at the foot of the cross. Jesus is on the cross and we are standing there. Just bring to your mind one person, just one person whom you have not forgiven. Just bring to your mind one person whom you have not forgiven. Just remember what that person has done. Yes, it brings a lot of emotions in me. I might be angry with that fellow. 
I might be irritated, I might be upset. It was absolutely wrong on part of that person to do that to me. I acknowledge my feelings. But then I also look at the cross. Can I surrender my feelings my feelings of anger, irritation, upset, whatever you name it, towards this particular person at the feet of Jesus. Can I let them go? And finally, can I say with much difficulty, I decide to forgive. I decide to forgive. Some of you, if you are comfortable, I won't force it. In your imagination, give a hug to that person. If not, if that is not possible, you don't want to do that, it's most okay. But you can at least decide that from today, if there is a chance to do good to that person, I will do it. Okay, you can open your eyes as you are feeling comfortable and we move to the second verse. The second word. Jesus looks at his mother and says, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, John, behold your mother. I've always found these words very interesting. And I wondered why Jesus had to wait to be on the cross, crucified, to say these words. You look at the other six words, Father, forgive them. He's addressing the soldiers who are crucifying him. You look at, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. He is addressing the thief besides him. You look at, I thirst. He's thirsty. All of these words could have been only done from the cross. But when you look at the words that he said to his mother and to his disciple, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. It's interesting because he didn't have to wait to be on the cross. He could have just spoken to Mother Mary a few days ago and said, you know what, Mom, I'm going to die in a few days, so I'm going to, you're going to be with John and he's going to take care of you. He could have told John the same thing. Yesterday after Monday, Thursday, after the Passover, he could have taken John aside and said, you know what, John, tomorrow I'm going to die. 
I'm going to entrust my mother to you. Take care of her. Or perhaps he could have also waited until he rose from the dead. He appeared to many people, so he could have appeared to John and said, John, take care of my mother now that I'm no longer alive. But why would Jesus say these words from the cross when he could have easily said it any other time during his life? I believe that Jesus says his words specifically because he's telling us from the cross through his own pain that he cares about our pain. He cares about our sufferings. He cares about our anxieties. He cares about everything and anything that disturbs our peace. When Jesus is facing the most excruciating pain of his life, he's got nails in his hands and his feet. He's got a crown of thorns on his head. He's been scourged a few hours earlier, walked with the cross all the way up to Mount Calvary. Excruciating pain. Even then, he sees his mother. And if he sees his mother, Jesus also sees us. He also sees our pain. He sees all our hurt, everything that's going on in our heads. He sees us and he sees right through us. That one look of Jesus to his mother changed everything. For Mother Mary, of course, changed everything. We're called to imitate Jesus. You see, most scholars would agree that Joseph perhaps would have already been dead by now. So therefore, it was Jesus' responsibility to take care of his mom. And now that Jesus is not going to be there anymore, he's giving the responsibility to Joseph. Like Jesus, we've got to ask ourselves, can we make sure that we are not consumed by our own pain, that we ignore or we miss the pain of other people around us? All of us are going through some kind of pain. Physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, difficulties in finances, offices, a lot of suffering. But often enough, we are so wrapped in our own difficulties that we, that we fail to see the struggles in other people, starting with our own families. We've got to remind ourselves that on the cross, and of course throughout his life, Jesus was human. So therefore, on the cross, he's feeling actual pain. Now, he could have very, be, very well been self-absorbed, consumed by his own pain. He didn't have to reach out to his mom. And if he, even if he didn't, it's okay, it's fine. He could have completely missed or ignored Mary's pain. But yet, he didn't. In the midst of his deepest pain, he's caring for others. He's caring for his own family. We kind of have to ask ourselves, when we fall ill or when we are in some kind of pain, we somehow seek or want the attention of the entire world. We try to make it about ourselves. You know, people don't understand our pain. They don't understand our suffering. We tend to compartmentalize suffering. My pain is bigger than your pain. You cannot feel what I'm going through. We isolate ourselves from the pain of others. But then look at Mary. While Jesus is in his own physical pain, Mary's pain is also something. Mary is also suffering, not physically, but more emotionally, spiritually. Yet Jesus reaches out to her. I think this is what Jesus calls all of us to do. Despite our pain, despite our anguish, despite all that we're going through, we should know that when we are weak, or even when we are the weakest, we can still help others. 
no matter how much we're going through, no matter how much we're suffering, we are still called by God, as Catholics, as Christians, to reach out to others, just like Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He placed Jesus in the care of John, his beloved disciple. Now, John was Jesus' beloved disciple, and of course, he was the only disciple or apostle at the cross. But let's rewind a couple of hours, maybe a little more than that. In the Gospel of Matthew, it states that every apostle fled. Matthew chapter 26, verse 56. Every apostle fled. Peter, James, Andrew, including John. John, Jesus' beloved disciple, the one who he loved, fled. But for some reason, some reason we don't know, maybe it is the love of Christ that Jesus had for John, or John had for Jesus, John came back to the cross. After fleeing the previous night, John comes back to the cross, and Jesus does not rebuke him, does not say, John, where have you been? I'm suffering. No condemnation, nothing. Instead, Jesus offers him restoration, forgiveness, and responsibility. And it's obvious that no matter how far we have gone from Christ, no matter how far we've gone from, our, from, the, from the cross, or no matter how far we've gone from the church, there is always a way back. No matter how much you have also denied Jesus, no matter how far you think you've gone, you're only a few steps back from the cross. Now, it's also interesting to know that since John was the last disciple or apostle standing, he was also the last apostle to die. And unlike the others, he did not die a martyr's death. He died of old age. All the other apostles, starting with James, were either martyred. Peter was crucified on an upside-down cross. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. Every other apostle was martyred besides John. The last man standing at the cross was the last one to die peacefully. He was also the last one to receive the revelation of Christ. I don't know if there's a connection between this, but for me, it's truly significant. And it tells us that if we come back to the cross, there's always a blessing for us. If we do not shy away from responsibility that Jesus offers, despite all our pain and suffering, there's always a blessing for us. And it might not be at this very moment, this very day, this very hour, this very year. It can be any time. But there's always a blessing for us. Like John, we are called to take Mary home. The next verse says the same thing. From that hour, the disciple took Mary home. We are supposed to take Mary home, not just statues, not just rosary, but Mary has to be in our hearts, and we have to live like Mary. A last point of reflection is we are called to also imitate Mary. You've got to be amazed by Mary's faith, Mary's courage. Her own son, the son that she gave birth to, her son that she seen walk for the first time, her son that she fed, her own son right now in front of her own eyes is being crucified, is being murdered, it's being killed, and it's being in pain. And the wonder of it all is that Mary is not passing out. She's not collapsing, she's not flinching. She's in tears, she's crying, she's hurt, yes. But she's standing strong. Even though she's suffering, she's standing firm in faith and in hope. We're all called to be like Mary. You go back when Mary was told that she's going to be the mother of God. She doesn't wait. She doesn't say, okay, I'm pregnant, so I can't move out. She leaves the house at that very moment and goes to visit her sister Elizabeth. And come back to the cross. She stands by Jesus on the foot of the cross. Despite her pain, she stands by Jesus' pain, although sometimes she probably did not fully comprehend what was happening. 
Mary trusted God without doubt. And no matter what, she still trusted God right till the very end. We are all called to do the same. I like now just to close your eyes for a few moments. Spend a few moments in reflection. We pray to Jesus who sees us from the cross. We pray to him to give us a sensitive heart to be able to see and empathize and sympathize with others despite all the struggles we're going through. We also ask the intercession of our Blessed Mother that in times of despair, she may lead us to Jesus on the cross. Because on the cross, we find strength. And on the cross, we find comfort to overcome all our pain. Mary stood by the foot of the cross, Jesus from the cross, putting his own trauma aside, ensures that she is taken care of after he passes away. Both are in terrible anguish and pain. One wonders how they still have the courage to bear all that they are going through. We can sum it up in two words, family and faith. We know Jesus lived for about 33 years. His ministry was for about three years. Therefore, in assumption, for 30 years of his life, Jesus lived with his parents under one roof. The last we hear in the Bible about Jesus' childhood was when he was with Mary and Joseph, and they hurried back to Jerusalem to find him in the temple. After this, the Bible does not explicitly give us any accounts of the Holy Family. Keeping in mind the sanctity of scripture and tradition in mind, I love to think of the Holy Family like one of our own families. Like any mother, I love to think of Mary going after Jesus like, eat your vegetables, keep your sandals in place, it is time for bed, and so on. And like any father, I like to think of Joseph, who probably taught his son the art of carpentry, going, Jesus, make sure you cut off that piece of wood in a straight line, put those tools back in its place. Typical parents, right? But Joseph and Mary provided for Jesus. They provided for Jesus not only in material, but also in a spiritual sense. Jesus was fully human and fully divine right from his birth. There's no doubt about that. But in some way, as parents, Joseph and Mary helped Jesus to bring his mission on earth to completion. All parents today are called to imitate Joseph and Mary. And at face value, parents are providing the best they can for their children the best of education, best of food, best of clothes, best of mobile phones and entertainment devices. The list can go on. But what about the best of religion and faith? For every parent here, at the time of your wedding nuptials, before God and his church, you promise to bring up your children in the faith. And it's not limited to baptizing them or throwing them a first Holy Communion party. Like Joseph and Mary, you're called to journey together with them in faith all through their lives. At Sunday school, I've had the privilege of interacting and helping the children grow in their faith. Over the years, however, we as a non-sacrament year in Standard 9 have witnessed a steady decline in the number of children that come to class. Today, if we get seven to eight students, we are thrilled. As teachers, we understand that the missing children are those who get only one Sunday to sleep, have tuitions, sports practice, don't have friends in the same class. The list is endless. Faith formation is taking a back seat, and with it, your child's ability to ask striking questions on their faith, because sometimes it is difficult to get answers at home or fear having the wrong question providing an environment that encourages curiosity and eagerness for your child's faith is equal 
than anything else, if not more important. As parents, you are the primary faith formators. I'm not talking about praying the angelus or rosary together, but I'm referring to the faith that you impart by example. Mary led by example. Jesus echoed her. At the Annunciation, Mary submitted to the will of the Father, and at Gethsemane, Jesus does the same. He too submits to the will of the Father. Do your children echo your faith? Are you able to have open conversations and open conversations about faith, beliefs, and values? Do you create a safe space where children can ask questions, express doubts, and explore their spirituality without fear of judgment? You're not expected to have all the answers. But what you can do is encourage your children to have a faith that seeks reason, understanding, and experience. For those of you who are parents here, or are parents who have children who are past their Sunday school and young years, I like to stress that we have young minds in our very own communities who are looking for the right answers in their quest of faith. Unfortunately, they are looking in the wrong places. It is our responsibility to provide guidance, support, and encouragement as they navigate questions of faith, identity, and purpose. We turn our attention back to the foot of the cross, and we recall Jesus' words to his mother and beloved disciple. In entrusting his mother to John, he entrusts his mother to us, the future church. But are we ready to entrust the church to our children. We spend a few moments in silent reflection. together. Heavenly Father, we lift up our families to you. Strengthen the bond between parents and children, siblings and relatives. Teach us to bear one another's burdens, to encourage and uplift each other, and to walk together in faith and love. May our homes be places of love, forgiveness, and mutual support, reflecting the unity and peace that Jesus desires for his followers. We also pray for those who are lonely or feeling disconnected from their families and communities. May they experience the comforting presence of your Holy Spirit and find companionship and belonging among those who believe in you. Lord Jesus, help us to follow in your footsteps, reaching out to those in need and extending hospitality and care to all whom we encounter. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.
reflecting on the gospel stories, we know that Jesus was often hanging out with people who weren't exactly accepted by society. It's like he had the special radar for finding out people who needed love and kindness the most. And one of the best examples was when he was being crucified on the cross. Imagine being in excruciating pain and suffering on the cross, but still having the heart to comfort the repentant thief next to him. He was suffering, yet he was still there for the thief. And when the thief asked Jesus to be remembered in his kingdom, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. It's like he was saying, no matter what you've done or where you've been, you will always have a place in my kingdom. This was the peak moment of inclusivity. And that's the beauty of Jesus' message. It's for everyone. Jesus just didn't hang out with the religious people or the good people. He welcomed everyone, irrespective of where they have come from, if they were outcasts or sinners. And he showed us that there are no outsiders in his eyes. As Christians, do we include and accept everyone, irrespective of their differences? Do we include people who have a faith different from ours, a sexual orientation beyond our understanding, languages not as common as ours? We have to remember that we need to be another Christ in the world today. And if we have to be like him, we need to be inclusive. I'd like to share with you a personal experience that I went through where I felt I was being included. I remember joining the Paris Youth Council core team around two years ago. I was nervous, wondering if I'd fit in. While they did include me and ask me for my opinion, there were times where I felt a bit left out. When they realized it, they made special efforts to include me. Now, looking back, I really appreciate the efforts that they put in during those times. Because including everyone isn't always an easy task. Our world is so full of differences. We have different ambitions, we have different statuses, and different selfish desires. And it is really difficult to be inclusive in nature. But putting aside the ambitious natures of the world, we are practicing inclusion in little ways that we find we can do best. We have Arman, where we encourage the differently able. We also have Pratna, with their study classes that give assistance to the weak and underprivileged children. And there are so many more ventures like this taking place in our parish. So let's take a moment to pause and remember one experience in our life where we felt that we've been part of an inclusive initiative, where we felt that we have been inclusive and included others. Remember that one experience in your life when you were part of an inclusive initiative. I ask you to recollect the feelings when you thought that people had made special efforts to make you feel included. As Christians, we are called to be like Christ, 
which includes making everyone a part of his family. Is it easy to see each person we encounter as a child of Christ and therefore a part of the same family? We struggle with this basic truth. Yet, if we have experienced the love of Christ in our own lives, that love will shine through in our interactions with others. It's not that Abraham had so much faith or Moses was such a great leader or that Hannah was so good at prayer. It's that God was at work in each one of them. Can you imagine the criminal on the cross next to Jesus walking into the gates of heaven and the angel asked him, are you baptized? No. Do you know any scripture? No. Did you pray every day? No. Then how did you get in here? Jesus said I could. We are as blessed as that man because God has bestowed the chance to experience his unconditional love and grace in each one of us. We are called to repent for our sins as we strive towards the way of God and he never stops loving us in our journey towards righteousness. The Bible shows us that God's unconditional love never fails and it is not motivated by personal gain. Jesus receives all who confess and believe just like he did the repentant thief on the cross. For as John chapter 13 verse 34 says, love one another as I have loved you. We are called to share the unconditional love that Jesus Christ has for us with whomever we meet. Jesus cast out unclean, sinful, tormenting spirits that held people captive and caused behaviors that excluded them from the community. He also dealt with people caught in the snares of wrongdoing, people like tax collectors who harmed others for their own benefit, or prostitutes who debased themselves to prosper or just survive. Such people were forgiven and transformed. Our God is good, he is forgiving, he is merciful, and he loves us despite the many sins that we commit. We therefore must repent for our sins. Everyone, rich and poor, male and female, Jew and Gentile, needs Christ's ministry of love and forgiveness in their lives. For even before Jesus was able to say, Today you will be with me in paradise. The repentant thief had to say, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. God delights in forgiving us. His mercy is overwhelming. He gives us a new life and a joy that we cannot imagine. And it changes everything. It renews our friendship with God because God loves a humble and contrite heart and he longs to restore his relationship with us. In our diverse and ever-changing world, it is easy to get caught up in debates over doctrine or tradition. But at the end of the day, what truly matters is how we treat one another with kindness, compassion, and the same unbounded love that Jesus shows to us all. At my college, for example, we are all encouraged to include everyone, despite of our many differences, with establishments like the Xavier's Resource Center for the Visually Challenged and the Inclusion Cell. We are all encouraged to include everyone, staff and students alike, and no one is made to feel that they do not belong. Because at the end of the day, we are all God's children and we are all equal in his eyes. If Jesus can extend a hand of forgiveness and grace 
to a repentant thief on the cross, then who are we to do any less? Maybe for a moment of silence, we reflect on whatever we have heard. Maybe we can recollect one experience in my life of experiencing the unconditional love of God. I thirst. Saint John was standing at the cross and he gives us this recorded evidence that in every cell of Jesus' body 
there was a thirst for water. But when we consider the entire mission of Jesus Christ, a whole new dimension is revealed in that cry, I thirst. It is a thirst coming from the depth of his soul for something far beyond bodily relief. It is a thirst for you. It is a thirst for me. It is a thirst for his church. It is a thirst for his church to come back to him. Just before Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, he saw in a flash the state of the members of his church and he prayed, I thirst that every baptized person be a witness in service of love. I thirst that the talents that I have blessed them with bear fruit and that the gifts of the Holy Spirit come alive in their lives. I thirst that every parent does not abandon or forsake the formation of little children. This failure, especially during the last three generations, has drawn my children to abandon me and to seek comfort in astrology, palmistry, or even occult practices. I thirst for digital missionaries. I thirst that these digital missionaries get active in my church. I pray that they work to unleash new energies, new forms of mission to protect and to guide my children against the negative influence and the abuse of digital platforms and artificial intelligence. I thirst for that day. The leadership in my church is acknowledged and respected as the voice on ethical guidelines and robust regulations on the use of artificial intelligence. Just before Jesus died on the cross, he saw in a flash and also felt deep within him the anguish and the agony of what polarizes and what divides human race. More specifically, the pain and anguish grew even more severe as he witnessed the divisions in his own church. He cried, I thirst for repentance of my people. I thirst 
for a spiritual renewal, for a healing, for all that has caused division and separation in this one church which I established. I thirst for the unity in my church that comes from the cross, the thirst for their coming back to my divine mercy ark. Just before Jesus went with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, I pray not only for these, referring to his disciples, but also for those who through their words will believe in me. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they be one in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. John 17, 20. I invite you to a brief reflection. Do I fix my eyes on Jesus and yet fail to do his will? Do I barricade my mind with certainties that prevent me from opening my ears to his cry of, I thirst for you to be that grain of wheat that falls onto the ground and dies in order that you bring unity in your homes, in your communities, and among Christian believers. I thirst for you to fix your eyes on me and become a doer of my will. We now have a testimony from Priya. I was a Marthomai Christian before I got married. There was no faith formation during my growing years. There were no prayers said at home. My father never went to church. My mother would sometimes go. Good Friday, Christmas, but very rarely. But she was a great devotee of Mama Mary. She would regularly go to Mahim Church on Wednesdays. Sometimes I wondered how she got this devotion, as Marthoma Church don't honor Our Lady. My mother encouraged me to attend Sunday school, which I did for a short time, then dropped out. The only prayer I learned was our Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which I prayed before going to bed. I stayed in a colony where we were the only Christian family. So all my friends were non-Christians. I would be a part of all their festivals and religious functions. Then God sent Leslie into my life. I don't know if he had second thoughts after knowing I had no prayer life but Jesus wanted me. He gave Leslie the courage to accept me. Now Leslie was keen that I become a Catholic before getting married. I was okay with it. When you're in love, you're ready to go through anything. So I had to go through some sessions for my transition to Catholic faith. I received my first Holy Communion and confirmation 
the day I got married. With Leslie, my spiritual journey growth started very slowly, but steadily. Right from early years of our marriage, I felt Jesus' presence, even when I was not yet into prayer life. During all our difficulties and trials, with all the blessings he bestowed on us and miracles that have taken place in our lives, I could feel Jesus transforming me little by little. I thank Jesus not only for Leslie's family, but for priests, religious and friends who have come into my life helping me grow in my faith. Today, when I look at my life, it's amazing how Jesus has molded me, getting me closer to him. And I know it's also Mama Mary helping me grow closer to Jesus. My mother, before she passed away, she told me, Mama Mary is your mother. She will take care of you. Today, my eyes are fixed on Jesus. I thirst to be like Jesus. We will have the hymn just to fix your eyes on Jesus and uh, you are requested to listen and make the hymn your own.
Almost we are in the middle of the session and I just want to do at this moment to take a review of what we are doing till now, to take stock of the situation which is very much a business term but also very much even at least in Jesuit spirituality. So I request all of you to close your eyes for a moment. Just once again imagine that you are standing at the foot of the cross where Jesus is at the cross the last moments of Jesus. And we have heard four verses already. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. You will be with me in paradise. And I thirst. Maybe among these four things, there would have been something that touched you. Just speak to Jesus about that thing which has touched you. And this is your personal time to talk to Jesus. Speak with him in your own way about what has touched you and he will respond to you. Listen to him too. Sometimes we may be distracted, but just come back and continue talking to Jesus. Maybe I invite you to open your eyes now. Okay, now I won't force this activity on you, but this would be wonderful to try it out. At least, if you are willing, can you share with the person next to you what something that has touched you at least till now? There can be a little bit of noise and that is perfectly acceptable at this point of time. I won't force you. But if you are free and willing, share with the person next to you. That person may be an absolute stranger. Don't worry. We don't know him. That's okay. But still, maybe can we talk? I give two minutes for that. If you are comfortable, do that. Otherwise, you can sit quietly.
Okay, this was a last minute activity since we had extra two, three minutes. But I think, I think it makes a lot of sense because we wanted to do it in this particular way because we wanted to give different perspectives from different angles. And probably you heard a perspective of a person, okay, probably that person is connected to you or not connected to you. Either way, you heard a perspective which you were never expected to hear at least today. So I think that was good. Thank you for participating and we move to the next fifth verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew describes the darkest moment of Jesus' crucifixion where for three hours the earth was shrouded with darkness until Jesus cried out, in anguish, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani. This painful cry of Jesus helps us to reflect on the great mystery and depth of his suffering on the cross. There are three points of reflection from this verse. First, what is the Psalm, uh, Psalm 22 connect? When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting the first verse of Psalm 22, which was a common psalm for the Jews to quote in times of trouble. So what is Psalm 22? Psalm 22 is a psalm with an initial lament, but however ends in eventual praise and confidence in God. It is about a righteous man who is going through great pain and suffering and he feels that God has abandoned him. But as the psalm goes on, you see that he, he realizes that God is actually present with him and that God is actually going to take control of himself. and that God will deliver him in the time that will come. On the cross, Jesus was repeating this psalm as a reflection of his own situation, which though it begins in complete dejection, it ends, however, in an eventual triumph. So what was the consequence of Jesus bearing the weight of our sin? On the cross, Jesus took upon himself the burden of humanity's sin. In other words, a sinless Jesus was made sin for us humans. 2 Corinthians Verse, chapter 5, verses 21. Resulting in Jesus experiencing separation from God the Father, which was a very painful experience on the cross. So did Jesus feel abandoned? By experiencing this separation from God on the cross, we see Jesus in his full humanity experiencing a great sense of abandonment and thus ensuring 
that there is no depth of human experience he has not shared. This also gives us a realization in pain that there might be no place where we might go where he has not been before. I repeat, a realization in pain, there might be no place where we might go where he has not been before. In the darkest moment on the cross, Jesus Christ, Jesus cry, does not signify defeat, but rather anticipates victory. Like the conclusion of Psalm 22, Jesus' trust is in God's eventual deliverance and victory over death through resurrection, thereby bringing redemption to all humanity. True victory lies in unwavering belief, even in the midst of great feeling of abandonment. Reflecting on the life of Mother Teresa, who endured decades of spiritual darkness despite her earlier encounters with God. When her book was published not long after her death under the title, Come Be My Light, some readers were shocked by these feelings coming from someone who was still a devout Catholic. Despite feeling forsaken by God, she continued her mission to serve the poor and seeing her suffering as a way to unite with Christ's own abandonment on the cross. Mother Teresa's continuing book, With the Poor, demonstrates that she believed in God, despite feeling abandoned.
There are four lessons that we learn from this saying of Jesus from the cross. First lesson, permission to question God. Jesus' cry on the cross shows that it's acceptable to express our pain and confusion to God. This challenges the notion that faith means suppressing our doubts and question. Instead, it encourages honest dialogue with God, knowing that He cares for us. The second lesson, acceptance of God's silence. Sometimes, despite our pleas, God may not provide an answer. This highlights the importance of accepting uncertainty and trust in God's plan, even in the absence of an understanding. The third lesson, distinguishing silence from absence. Silence from God doesn't imply his absence. Rather, it signifies his unseen workings in our lives. Reflecting on past experiences can reveal how God was present and active even when we felt abandoned. The fourth lesson, Jesus' empathy with human pain. Jesus' own sufferings enables him to empathize with our pain, knowing that he understands our struggles, offers solace and reassurance, inviting us to surrender our burdens to him in prayer. Kindly kneel. Prayer. O Lord Jesus, though I will never fully grasp the wonder of your abandonment by the Father, every time I read this word, I am overwhelmed with gratitude. How can I ever thank you for what you suffered for me? What can I do but to offer myself to you in gratitude and praise? Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for being forsaken by the Father so that I may never be. The sixth verse, it is finished. The agony is not finished, but there is one more verse. I have, fought the, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Second letter to the Timothy 4.7. This is a verse which we often hear. Either somebody is saying during the funerals or something like that, where people say it's about other person, that yes, that person has fought the good fight. Now, what is finished in Jesus? It's interesting that this is not the last verse. This, okay, the scripture scholars believe that this is the second last verse. And the last verse is not just about the mission, it is about his trust in the Father. That you will hear later. But this verse is when he says, yes, I have finished my mission. It is finished. What was the mission of Jesus? Definitely the most explicit answer to that is from the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus says, from the book of Isaiah, which is repeated, the Spirit of Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, 
and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. And when Jesus says it is finished, it means, yes, his mission in that sense or in some sense has been finished. I think it is important here also to distinguish between finished and fully completed. Jesus' mission continues. His mission as an incarnate son that ends there or as a human being in this world born of Virgin Mary in that sense it is completed but Jesus is risen he continues to work even today so his mission is not completed or full in that sense but it's an understanding that his mission in some sense is finished or in simple words if I ask if I say Jesus' mission was simply to reveal the love of the Father. If you take any of the beautiful parables or the beautiful scenes in the gospel, it is always about the love of the Father. Take the parable of the prodigal son. Take the, par take the incident where that woman was caught in the act of adultery. Take the example of Zacchaeus. In all these cases, Jesus, in different ways, he is trying to reveal that love of the Father. Now, it is not that this love of the Father was never there in the Old Testament, but sometimes it was forgotten. Even the Ten Commandments are a beautiful expression of the love of the Father. But the only difficulty can be we forget the essence of the Ten Commandments and can limit ourselves to certain rules and regulations. That's why Jesus beautifully summarized the Ten Commandments into two. Love God and love neighbor as yourself. The tragedy of Christian life sometimes can be that we follow all the Ten Commandments, but we don't love. I think there can be no other greater tragedy. We might say, I did everything, but still I did not do anything. Jesus has come to do the will of the Father. He is the very expression of the Father. Now, interestingly, at the end of his mission, when he, just before he's saying it is finished, now we can look from a very, very business analytical perspective. He had 12 disciples. Okay, one was there at the foot of the cross. That also he was there. All the other left. We don't know about so many people whom I've interacted, how many of them still remain to be the disciples. Now, what is the success? I think for Jesus, it was not about success. It was about following the will of the Father. And following the will of the Father automatically leads to fruitfulness in life. If you check by success, I would say, I don't know whether you will agree, but at least on that Good Friday, if we check, we would say that Jesus was a failure. Excuse me, he said so many things, he so, spoke so many things, and finally, they all expected that he will save, and finally, he died on the cross. Okay, he got resurrected, that's a different story. But if I'm looking at that day, I don't know that resurrection is going to happen. I would imagine, or everybody at that day would imagine that Jesus' story was a failure. But at that moment, Jesus is saying, it is finished. And I think that is the beauty of his life. He was completely in tune with the Father, with the mission of the Father. And maybe that is also the invitation for each one of us. When we follow God's will in our lives, it automatically always do not lead to success. It definitely will lead to fruitfulness in our life. That is definite but it automatically will not lead to success in many situations. Many a times, Paul sowed the seeds, Apollos watered, and somebody else finally saw the fruit. My grandfather planted the seed, I am enjoying the fruit. My grandfather could have easily said that if the fruit is going to come in next year only, I am going to water this plant, but he never did it. This is a simple law of nature. 
but this law of nature we find it so difficult to follow in our spiritual life and i think it also means that jesus also have to move on my mission is complete at least in this sense i am moving on the next part of the mission and i think this is all the more evident in the asc ascension too after the resurrection jesus had to go back it is not my mission here is fulfilled i will be there with you in another form but not in this form maybe it's good to ask ourselves what it means for us all of us have our own mission i think that's the first message which church in the recent many years repeatedly tries to give us all of us have our own mission why or where we get our mission it's not written somewhere i think we all get our mission through one common thing that all of us have which is which is our baptism whether you are a priest religious married unmarried whatever it is you are always baptized and baptism is a place of christian dignity each one of us get our mission from baptism and i think that's why the second vatican council many other popes documents in the recent years they continue to reaffirm the dignity of human beings of christians in derived through baptism sometimes we speak much about the priestly dignity the dignity as a religious person as a married person all of them are important but all of them are based in the baptismal dignity and that is where our vocation arises starts from maybe another theme which i want to reflect on on this theme is to move on it is finish now many of you sitting here might be parents now when children come to me for confession i tell them quite often they say the parents don't understand me i tell them one thing parents i ask them are you the eldest son or daughter some of them say yes no i at least i tell the eldest ones for your parent also this is the first time that's correct they are also learning the art of being a parent they don't have many opportunities probably if you have two children okay you have some opportunity at least you can rectify some mistakes in the second child so now as a parent you are a parent from birth of the child at least till your death but parenting differs at each age it differs at the very small age probably you do everything for the child now after a certain age child does not want you to do everything and after a little more age child does not want you to do many things and probably it is difficult for the parent to accept this aspect we also have to understand that yes it is finished child at one level is finished my responsibility as this type of parent is finished i move to a different type of parent can i keep on moving the difficulty sometimes is we are stuck now i'm not saying this is not only about parents i as a priest today probably i am in this parish if i go from orlam at the end of may oh this orlam was a wonderful place people were so wonderful and if i go to a place where there are not so many catholics there are not so many people to interact with i can still remain in orlam oh that people in orlam they were nice they always say wonderful things yeah that is a difficulty orlam was wonderful definitely yes but each of our mission keeps on evolving marriage when children are married i think my own baba the sweet baba of my own is no more my own sweetest baba he or she still remains so but the most beloved person of that person's life is no more me and i think this is something parents have to accept understand yes that role is finished we have to move on death sometimes death happens in our families i completely understand that death is a very very difficult aspect to accept sometimes terrible death happens untimely deaths we might be completely shocked 
taken up by that death. But at some point, we have to also finally bid farewell. We may not bid always farewell when we are burying that person, but somewhere we have to bid farewell to that person to live. I was watching a beautiful movie called 127 Hours. I don't know whether you have seen that movie. It's a beautiful movie. You get in online very freely. It's a movie, a movie about a boy called Aaron Ralston, who was a mountaineering expert. He, okay, he was a software engineer, but his passion was going for hiking. And he went for hiking to a particular place. Now, he went for a just one day hiking. He never thought that it was required to inform his parents and things like that, so nobody knew where he went. But by mistake, he fell into a deep down place. And, okay, by, by luck or whatever it is, he was stuck in such a way, he did not fell to the ground, but stuck in such a way that, that his hand was stuck, was in, it was in between two stones. And the stones were so huge that they cannot move. He tried so many means to do move the stone with the pulley, this, making that. He's hanging for 127 hours. And he's trying, doing all those things. And finally, the only thing which he could do to escape, he knew that there was no possibility that nobody will reach there. I don't know whether he had mobile, but anyway, there was no mobile connection there. So, finally, he cut his hand. One, okay, that was the only option available for him to, to live. And finally, somehow he managed to get in. He moved a little bit. After three hours of walking, he found another group of people. And finally, he was saved. Now, his passion was hiking. And this man, he could have very easily said, okay, this is over. But still, he put up an artificial hand. After two, three years, he again went for hiking. And he continued hiking. My one level was finished. But that does not mean my mission is not finished. My mission continues. Without death or without acceptance at many situations, no renewal is possible in our lives. My dear friends, as it was already mentioned for the last verse, faith and doubt, faith and anguish, faith and pain, faith and desolation, faith and anger, they all can go together. I'm sure that there are many people sitting here who have very strong difficulties, struggles, pain, sufferings in their lives. But still, you all have beautiful faith too. Sometimes we think that they cannot go together. Jesus shows, have not to give in to those feelings. Probably at that moment when he says it is finished, he would have felt at least a little bit of disappointment somewhere in his heart. It's a very, very human emotion. But he did not give in to that emotion fully. He accepted that emotion, but finally said, yes, this was my father's will. I accept it and it is finished. Maybe we take a moment of silence. And we surrender to the Lord the areas in our life where we find difficult to move on. Maybe it is related to one person. Maybe it's related to one particular event in my life. I just bring that to my awareness and I surrender that. Yes, that event, that person probably is over or that type of relationship is over and I am moving on. Lord, help me. I am surrendering it to you.
I surrender before the Lord all my struggles and difficulties all the areas where I find so difficult to move on the areas in my life which is probably sinful I know that it is sinful but I still struggle to move maybe areas where I don't find an inch of hope that moments of despair that friendship which I had with that person somehow got broken and I can't move on that relationship which I had which was broken and I still struggle to move on I surrender this for that same lord i surrender those moments in my life which were joyful happy but i have to move on i cannot hold on to them can i thank for those memories thank can i thank for those persons who allowed me to create those memories but yes i have to move on Jesus loved his disciples but he has to go back in the same way each one of us too have to leave aside not only our painful memories but sometimes even the strong good nice wonderful memories can i surrender them and sing once again we have journeyed with jesus on the way of the cross and reached golgotha where jesus hangs on the cross crucified we hear his last words from the cross father into your hands i commit my spirit I invite you now to close your eyes and picture yourself standing before the cross along with Mother Mary, 
John, his beloved disciple, and Mary Magdalene. Try to recall for a moment the many times you have uttered these words. Perhaps you may have said, Jesus, I surrender my son going for his first job interview. Or my daughter answering her first board exam. Or my spouse unwell and longing for him or her to recover. You may now open your eyes. By this simple prayer we utter, we express our trust with hope and persevere in faith that God will surely listen and answer our prayer. My wife, Brunita, stands beside me as a cancer survivor. In the church present here are many other cancer survivors. After a 10-day holiday in Goa, it ended up with a 10-month stay in Goa. When I got the news of Brunita's cancer of the stomach from the doctor, I was surprised and shocked and even pained as well. I took recourse to prayer, and my first words were, Jesus, I surrender Brunita to you. You know best. Your will be done. It was not easy, but my deep faith gave me the strength to journey with her. Hearing the word cancer did not frighten me, but I was truly taken aback. I did not realize the very long, extensive, strong, and life-threatening treatment I was in for. The doctor explained the whole procedure and all its consequences to both Gladwin and me. After hearing him out, I just surrendered myself to the good Lord and said, you take over now. That felt so good and I got an inner peace. Surgery, chemotherapy, radiation were all lined up for me. However, after surrendering myself to the Lord, I did not give in to despair, depression, or self-pity. Prayer became a very strong part of my life. I gained a lot of strength and courage from it. My Jesus was with me, holding my hand all along the way. The moments of nausea, pain, lack of appetite, losing my hair, feelings of weakness, 
tiredness. Do not make me indulge in crying or in self-pity. My gladi was always with me, along with my sister and her family, who kept supporting me with their love, care, and deep faith. In moments like this, it is truly our deep faith in the Lord which pulls us through very difficult situations. Care, prayer, medication, the word of God and faith are so very vital for a complete cure. But it is the surrendering of ourselves to the Lord, which is the very first step one has to take. We started taking one day at a time with the Lord, and He worked miracles every day in our lives. We praised Him for it and continue to do so. All of us have journeyed in this season of Lent, a season of immense graces and blessings, a period of change and renewal, a, pe a period where we often heard in the liturgy and scriptures words such as repent and believe mercy and compassion, forgive and let go. As Jesus crucified hangs on the cross, he invites you and me to surrender our ego, our pride, our selfishness, our stubbornness, our jealousy, our bitterness, our unforgiveness towards our brothers, sisters, family, friends, neighbors, spouses, and others, so that we all truly experience and, and, and receive the joy of the resurrection in our own lives. This surrendering brings about a true sense of inner joy, happiness within oneself, and gives each of us a feel-good factor from deep within, and you begin to enjoy life. God also invites us to place at the foot of the cross our talents, our strengths, our joys that come our way at home, at our workplace, the companionship and warmth we experience and share with friends and loved ones, the fun and laughter that we have with close bonded ties and with well-wishers. We do not know what our todays and tomorrows will be like. But once we surrender our all to the Lord, things will truly work out for the best for each one of us according to his will and plan for us. God is inviting you and me to a life of abundance which he has promised and honors. Won't you like to take him up on his offer as he hangs on the cross crucified? This is the supreme sacrifice he has made for you and me, and we thank him.
Dear friends, as we have journeyed along with the seven verses, along with Jesus, maybe it's also important to realize that Good Friday was a single day in the life of Jesus. In other words, the entire life of Jesus was not pain and suffering. His public ministry most often was centered on love and joy. Even when Jesus encountered suffering of any kind in his life, during his lifetime, he always tried to alleviate suffering. He healed, he did many healings, he did many other miracles. 
So Good Friday should not give us a feel that we should glorify sufferings unnecessarily, but it should put us in the right spirit that suffering at some moment is inevitable and when at such moments we can also surrender the suffering like Jesus and our suffering can become redemptive. And probably that is an invitation for each one of us. And the same Jesus who said the seven verses on the cross, maybe some, somebody has beautifully summarized those seven verses and it helps us to understand our own struggles or Jesus is trying to understand our struggles through each of these verses. I'll just explain what he has said. The first verse about forgiveness. It's an invitation that Jesus understand the challenge of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not always easy. The second verse which we did here about Mary and John. Jesus understands the love of a parent. Jesus sometimes also understands the struggle associated with that. The third verse, the verse where we sp spoke about the good thief. Jesus understands the struggle in accepting others, including others, and also in an unconditional love. The fourth verse, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabaktani. Jesus understands the struggle of abandonment, but not staying there. In the fifth verse, I thirst. Jesus understands the physical pain and many other pains. In the sixth one, I am finished. Sorry, it is finished. Jesus understands a certain disappointment, but he doesn't stay there. And the last one, I surrender to you, Father. Jesus understands self-offering. Each one of us may have our own struggles. Maybe one verse will inspire us, and that may be a good thing to pray on and help us to deal with our own struggles. Maybe as a last exercise, I invite all of you to close your eyes for one moment. We have heard so many things during this day. And I'm sure that you will hear many more things in the evening. There are probably so many things which people have said that have touched me. Can I just take one particular takeaway? And I'm going to deepen that in my life in the coming days. What is that takeaway that I'm taking from this three hours agony? I'm sure many of you might be inspired by many things, but it is sometimes important to pinpoint at least one particular thing. We offer that to the Lord in the same spirit where Jesus has offered himself and said, into your hands I commend my spirit. In the same way we say, into your hands I commend my inspiration. That particular thought or feeling or idea or intuition that have touched me deeply. And I request all of you to stand for the final prayer before the final hymn. And you can repeat the prayer after me. It is not there. 
crucified and risen Lord. Crucified. Make us forgiving people. Make us forgiving people. Make us receive and give unconditional love. Make us receive and give unconditional love. Help us to surrender our life struggles and joy. Help us to surrender our life struggles and joys. Help us to fight for justice and peace. Help us to fight for justice and peace. Help us to care for one another. Help us to care for one another. Help us to be partners and collaborators of your mission. Help us to be partners and collaborators of your mission. Help us to love. Help us to love. Help us to accept ourselves as we are. Help us to accept ourselves as we are. Help us to continue to receive your mercy. Help us to continue to receive your mercy. Amen. Amen. And we sing the final hymn.
please be seated for two minutes. I would like to thank all of you for being here for this station, for this three hours with the Lord. I would like to thank Joyce and Brinston, who did the meditation with us on women, behold your son, on Aina and Niharika, who did the meditation with us on you will be with me in paradise. Leslie and Priya, who did the meditation on I Thirst. Mervyn and Carol, who did on Eli Eli Lama Shabaktani. And Gladwin and Brinita, who did on Father Into Your Hands, I Commit My Spirit. And I also like to thank Priya, Russell, Andrea, and Ayana, who did the choir for each one of us. We thank each one of you for being here. Thank all of you. And pray that Good Friday continue to be a wonderful experience for us and we may grow in the experience of the crucified and risen Lord. Amen. Hello, check. 